respected ufologist and lecturer on the highly controversial and speculative topics of Planet X and UFOs. In the prophecies of Nostradamus, one of the more famous predictions refers to the arrival uh, from a what we call a thing that will profoundly change life on Earth. Nostradamus refers to this thing as the great king of terror. Could Nostradamus have foreseen the coming of a celestial body that would wreak havoc here on Earth? Hopefully, we will get some definitive answers on just this and what is causing our Earth to leapfrog into a sudden tailspin. Our guest, Dr. Jason Rand, is a respected researcher and lecturer on the topic of UFOs. His contributions in the study and pursuit of extraterrestrial communications, research into UFO phenomena, cosmology, and his representing the United States at the first World UFO Congress in Tucson in 1991, earned him distinctive recognition and his doctorate from the Russian Academy of Sciences on December the 18th of 1992 in Moscow. Dr. Rand wrote a book in 2007 concerning a rogue planet, which some keen observers have reported as having a universally disturbing effect on our solar system and planet Earth in particular. The return of Planet X is an educational, informational source examining all aspects of this controversial subject, including the record of X's ancient science of prophecy its phantom astronomy, forbidden archaeology, and the signs of its approach. Welcome to our show, Jason. Thank you so much, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with your audience today. Thank you. In your book, The Return of Planet X, you explain the extreme dangers uh, potentially posed by Planet X, which uh, another name for it is Wormwood. Uh, now, I have uh, personally been uh, hearing many things about Planet X uh, since I first became interested in the subject back at the beginning of uh, 2003. But um, for those listening who may be hearing about the planet for the first time, I wonder if you could explain to all of us what exactly Planet X is and when did you first begin your research on this uh, mystical planet? All right. First of all, Let's define what a brown dwarf star is. A brown dwarf star is usually a smaller celestial body that is a, either a failed or an unignited fusion sun. Our sun is a fusion sun. It creates heat and energy, and that's what keeps us alive here on planet Earth. Now, we believe that... I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump back and forth here, but I'm going to answer all four questions in this one explanation. We believe that about four and a half to five billion years ago, during the formation of our solar system, which we believe, according to our research, and of course Sumerian te uh, technology and, and information and philosophy and sciences, all indicate that there were 12 planets originally formed in our solar system. 12, not the nine we have. And that about four and a half to five billion years ago, a very, very large uh, errant object, possibly a huge asteroid, you know, a gigantic asteroid, crashed into one of the 12 planets, which was called Marduk, according to Sumerian cosmology, Marduk. And when this collision occurred, Marduk shattered into billions of pieces, some very large, some, some much smaller, and most of the, of the debris that came off of Marduk was what eventually formed, they believe, our asteroid belt. All right? Okay. All right, so far so good. Now, a large piece of this planet, this Marduk, apparently flew off into space, and it happened to collide head-on with this little baby sun, this unignited uh, fusion sun, which was still in its infancy uh, as, as captured by our, our, the gravity of our sun. All right? And it hit it at such an angle that it knocked it completely out of its regular orbit. Okay, we have to jump for a second. All of the planets in our solar system rotate in a counterclockwise motion. Just envision that. In other words, all of the planets are circling the sun in a counterclockwise motion. 
So we're talking about an ecliptical plane then, right? Yes, okay. exactly. And this particular body, when it was struck, was so impacted that it spun it out in, its, in, an, in an almost 180 degree trajectory, which then sent it on a clockwise motion around the sun rather than a counterclockwise. And that it hit it so hard that it knocked it into a very long, elongated, between 3,600 and 4,000 year orbit way out into the deep reaches of space, way beyond Pluto, way, way out there, and then coming back and circling back. And we think, at least the theory in our book, and now substantiated, by the way, did you know that there are over 100 books out on Planet X right now? And I'm, Really? Yes, but I'm pleased to say that we were one of the first ones, one of the first ones, not the first one, to be able to get to press and get it into distribution before this phenomenon really hit the Internet because this was a seven-year project in the making. All right. So this celestial object gets knocked out into this huge elliptical orbit. Um, imagine, um, Steve, if you had a very large rubber band and you, you gripped it at both ends and you pulled it in opposite directions, what you'd create is an imaginary elliptical orbit. That's, that's what it looks like. Okay? So at every 3,600 to 4,000 years, we believe this physical object, this unborn sun, this smoldering brown dwarf planet, it could be the size of our moon, it could be the size of the earth, it could be even larger. That I'm not able to, to affirm one way or the other. It is certainly as large as the moon in any event because of its mass and what it's already creating throughout its approach into our solar system. Okay. I had actually heard that it might be as much as four times the size of the earth. It could, yes. It, it's Which would put it in comparison with uh, the planet Jupiter, is that correct? Jupiter, or? yes, that is absolutely correct. I mean, that, that would be its extreme. I think, personally, I think it's somewhere in between, but let's, let's go on back to its oncoming passage, okay? All right. So, we believe, according to the research in our book, and by the way, the last time this object came through, at least according to the research that we did, by the way, we had to read 2,000 books over a period of seven years, and I've referenced all those books uh, with reference points throughout our book so that a person could go back and check the information. We found out that it's now believed that the last time Planet X, the object we're talking about, this brown dwarf star, this mystery object coming from space, the last time it came through, we believe, was in the year 1447 BCE, before the Common Era, which means before Christ. And it just happens to coincide with the Exodus when Moses was leading the Israelites out of Egypt. They were in bondage for 400 years under Pharaoh. And that could very well explain a lot of the miracles that were attributed to Moses' rod. Remember when he threw it down and it turned into a serpent? Correct. Biblically? Okay. Yep. This would also explain the rivers turning the blood color because of the red dust the skies turning red, the, the moon and the sun seemingly stopped, and there, there just happens to be that there was a huge volcanic eruption nearby, not too far, and also a huge earthquake. All of this occurred when Moses, they were like signs from God. Okay, now if we're right, it would also explain how the Red, how the, how the, how the red Sea parted. Because if it sloshed in its basin because of a large earthquake, wouldn't the water move to one side? Could it remain, actually pour? And remain I mean, the there. Story and is then, it actually ported, or did it actually just move off to one side enough to where uh, uh, Moses and his people could cross? Yeah, it, I doubt if it. I doubt if it parted like we saw in. The, in remember in the original movie? Done yeah, we see parting in, in two different directions. Yeah, no, I think that would probably happen. Most logically, so was that. There was this huge earthquake. It sloshed the, 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 the lake out of its basin, at least partially so, allowed the Israelites to go through, and then nature takes over. The planet, you know, realigns herself, and the water comes back. I mean, that's the most logical explanation. Yes, it was a miracle. I'm not saying it wasn't a religious miracle. I'm only saying it sure happened at the right time at the right moment. Now, we were so fortunate. Our book was picked as the top, credited book on the subject and we're right on the front page and we're really proud of that and I had to tell you I just I'm so pleased at it. it 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 came with great sacrifice because 
we've been we've been giving our books to libraries and things like that, and now people are starting to call in. I've had requests from the White House and the Hoover Foundation and a whole bunch of other organizations. It's gratifying, and we thank you. What is the interest? And we in thank the White you for House? having us on. What what is the White House interested in this? What, for what for what? Well, I just purpose? I just got a, an email request. Uh, with it, when we please send a book to the attention of the of the science advisor for the White House, and we did. I haven't heard anything back yet. It's only been a couple of months. That's not unusual. They must get a thousand books a month. You know what I mean? Okay. But anyway, so they requested it, and and I'm I was grateful for it. But I haven't heard uh, what what the feedback is yet. Um, however, I am this coming uh, next Wednesday. I am meeting with the senatorial aide to one of the two senators here from Mississippi, um, uh, Thad Cochran, and I'm going to be presenting them a copy of the book, and I'm going to ask for a meeting with the senator the next time that he's at the state capitol, because I believe Mississippi, which, of course, where I live, is, very, is going to be very vulnerable for this forthcoming hurricane season. Well, because it's, it's cyclical, but the planet is ratcheting itself up. You see, when you're talking... The, the science and the chemistry and the philosophy of something as complicated as planet Earth, nothing happens faster because it's so big. But what is happening is that it, something that cannot be stopped. The planet itself is getting ready to go through this huge transition. It feels it. It knows it's coming. It happens every 36 to 4,000 years. Let, let, let's cruise into something real interesting. Let's just assume that we could take off our rational thinking caps and just put on our, well, what if let's explore cap and say, suppose the earth itself is a living entity and a being with a soul and a mind and that it reasons. It just does all these things in ways which we are unable to communicate with. Now, if you understand how the planet functions and how it works, you have to understand that its primary flow and rotation and, and dynamic principles, including plate tectonics, all occurs because of interaction with the planet's core. Okay, If something affects the core of our planet, it could affect its rotation, its speed, its plane of inclination. A lot of things can happen. And I believe that the core, the center core of planet Earth, has been in an excitation phase for possibly as long as six to seven years, it started about six or seven years ago, very very slowly. Because well, what's, your, what's your take on um, some of these uh, skeptics out there? Uh, you know, and of course, you know, we got a lot of these global warming skeptics too that are running around saying everything is is of a natural uh, occurrence. But what's your take on those skeptics who say that uh, the activity that might be going on in the Earth's core? is because of activity that's now occurring uh, on the surface of the sun. They're absolutely correct. They're, they're absolutely correct. I was, I was on my way to that. I was about to say that the core of our planet could be most affected by what happens on the core of the sun and what the sun's energies and emissions are transmitted to us. We receive huge amounts of solar radiation, and that is what, from the sun, that is what heats and also causes weather and cools the planet. Now, if that were severely disrupted or changed, it would change all the dynamics of how the planet operates. Its weather systems, its rotational patterns, its seasonal incl its inclinations, all of these things are affected by what happens to its core. And we think that this incoming body has been affecting the inner core of the sun because of its mass, and therefore, when the core of the sun gets excited, it sends out more energy and more types of radiation, and I believe some kinds that we don't even totally understand yet. Okay, we've never ever been affected by a brown dwarf star in modern day times. If this is what we think, and I think it is, and I ask you the question, why did they spend billions and billions of dollars to build a quote top secret solar observatory at the South Pole? In the yeah, there's a lot of, of speculation about that now too. You know, sure. But why do you think they built it? I believe that they simply built it because that'll be the greatest viewing position for this body as it comes swinging in from underneath the solar system, starting to arc up and over it. It's going to be coming up from the south. It's been emerging from the glare of the sun for the last 
15 to 20 years on its approach to us. All the time that it's been speeding toward us during this 36 to 4,000 year period, most of it has been because it's coming from behind the sun. We can't possibly see it. We can't see through the sun. We can barely see through the glare around the sun, you see? So if we're right, and if a lot of the present-day cosmologists, and by the way, this is a subject that's under study all around the world. I, I, I just returned from Russia. I was there for about 20 days. And I had a chance to sit and talk with a colleague of mine, um, Colonel Marina Popovich, the, the, the Russian heroine test pilot lady. She's, she and I have been friends right, for like 20 right. years. Anyway, we talked exclusively, and I had a chance to talk to some of the people from the academy, and they take this very seriously. They're now conducting their own studies. They are, they are not open to the public. They are, they are quiet studies. They're not, they're not secret or kept, kept in secret, but until the facts are disclosed, the information is really being carefully digested. They have now, their own, academy, they have their own solar, solar situ, uh, they're going to be taking their own pictures from the South Pole. They're making arrangements now. Oh, okay. Are they, are they an independent entity from the government, the Russian government? It, uh, y yes and no. They're under the auspices of the Russian government, but they are totally independent. All, that kind of control ended when the wall came down. Things are much more open there. So it's the Russian government's uh, position with as their well approval. that something is going on. Yes, the, the, the government officially says this is your business. You do it. We don't. You know, we're out of it. We, we're into other things. Okay. Which is which I think is intelligent and and sensitive to the fact that sometimes you have to be unobstructed in order to get the mission done. All right. Something, by the way, has been perturbing many of the outer planets, and they now believe that it's this planet X. By the way, did you know that NASA, this is, first of all, this is not even a new story. If I was to tell you that in 1982, NASA itself published this huge story. By the way, that article in the Washington Post and the Washington Times and, and Globe, all of those stories are included in our book, The Return of Planet X. Well, aren't they, they claiming out, that that was a mistake on their part? Uh, yes. This, uh, reporting? No, not a mistake. They were, yeah. the, the people at NASA were so excited that one of their telescopes had found something that they blurted it without running it through the White House and, and the Pentagon and, and all of the think tanks. Well, this kind of news could have completely rattled everybody across the planet if it was true. So immediately, the Washington Times jumped on it, the Globe and also the New York Times, and they ran with stories in the next day or two. Suddenly, those stories were instantly pulled. All the newscasts were cleansed. There was never another word about it, and to this day, they still don't talk about it. But it's been in print. They announced it as early as 1982, and it's been basically pigeonholed, covered up, whatever you want to call it. By the way, I'm not a conspiracy buff. I don't, I don't see conspiracy <laughs> everywhere. A lot of people in my field do, and I don't. I'm very realistic about what is and what isn't. However, there are certain things that are being you know, conspiratorial and being covered up, like the Roswell incident, as just one for instance. Well, what was the precise position of Planet X back in 1982 when NASA first discovered it? I think that they somehow they, they cited it from a distant probe. I, I think, I'm not exactly sure. I've tried to find this out. I've, I've got friends inside and we can't, you just can't talk about it. It's, it is so weird and so dark a subject to them because they know that there's nothing we can do about it. See, I guess the reason they don't want to talk about it is there's nothing they can really do about it. You know, all, remember the movie Armageddon when they sent out the, the two spaceships? And right. They, that's, that's not no. That's not right. I didn't mean. It's not feasible. It doesn't work that way. We wouldn't have enough resources to launch three vehicles if we had to. Okay. But the point is, I guess what they're doing is they're slowly getting the government ready. Now I will say that I think that there, if if there's a conspiracy going on to cover it up, I also have to say that I think they're smart enough to know. I do believe that Denver, Colorado would become Washington West, by the way. I used to live in Denver. I, I really liked it there. I was there for about three years. Yeah, I believe there's an under, some kind of underground uh, facility there for the, for the VIPs. Yes. 
and there's a whole government center built under the Capitol. It's it's they've been they've been doing this very quietly. We, we have a U.S. mint. We, are we I'm not there. They have a U.S. mint. They have a world class zoo. They have one of the most important airports ever built in the United States. That airport is far more than an airport. I really don't want to go into it because that should be the subject of another show for us, by the way. Okay. All right. They are preparing Denver for what I believe would be a rush to the west if something should devastate the east coast. All right. Now, why would Denver be a uh, safe haven for these people? You, you mean in, 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 in terms of earth changes? Well, right. Denver would certainly be subject to probably some earthquakes and some shaking, but it's not going to get, I don't think it will get any volcanic problems un, unless Yosemite goes. If Yosemite goes, you, you know about Yosemite, right? Yes. yes. Okay. It's a super we, volcano, we have what's known right? as a super volcano right yes. smack in the middle of our country that could blow it apart, that could literally tear the continent in half. That's another sub- that's another whole show right there. I mean, they <laughs> have right. specials on these things, by the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> National Geographic, you can find almost anything on what we're talking about. So you see, the kinds of things, Stephen, that we're talking about are not so hocus pocus, mumbo jumbo, crazy p- paranoia stuff. Oh no, this is real stuff that's this going on. This is all real you stuff. That. Have you have you watched the Weather Channel lately? L- let me ask you something. It used to be when you turned on the Weather Channel, what you had was a really interesting of banter and, and chit chat and talk about this and that and it's raining here and it's thundering over there. Now it's all about nothing but disasters, forest fires, wildfires, earthquakes, um, sinkholes, tornadoes, hurricanes, w- straight line winds. Well, they refer to it. And they on. refer to it as uh, extreme events. Yeah, we're kind of in the grips of a really bad extreme event, but nobody wants to really call it that. Listen, we've got high gas prices. We've got a difficult election coming up. We've got terrorists sniffing up our blouses. We, we've got uh, problems possibly with fuel disruptions. We've got a dysfunctional Congress, Senate and legislature. And I can go on and on and on and on, okay? Everybody's default, by the way. There is nobody there in Washington that is really functioning like an American citizen should function as to what is best for the country. Well, I certainly okay, agree no, with that. Enough about that. I didn't mean to go there. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's true, Stephen. And all of this is about to come down on their shoulders, and they're still talking about Now, if I'm right about this coming hurricane season, and that's the reason I'm going to meet with Senator Thad Cochran, his aide on Wednesday and then request a meeting with the senator is that Mississippi is not ready. I've been talking. I took a trip down there. I've been looking around. People aren't really aware of about what's to happen. I'm afraid that the Gulf Coast region is going to get hit by a very bad hurricane. Oh, it's very one or possibly so all the way least, from Texas to Florida. So it, it could it could hit anywhere. I think it's going to hit Louisiana and Mississippi this time. Well, I hate to uh, hear that because I'm is, right in the middle of all that. <laughs> I know you are. You're in Baton Rouge. Yep. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. That's how they say it. Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. I'm I'm pretty good at lingu- linguistics. Which, by the way, is an Indian term for the red stick. Yes. Yes. Incidentally, speaking of Indians. We cover a whole section in the book on on ancient legends and cosmology of all these groups. Who do you think was giving them all this celestial information? I don't think it was the magic mushroom, do you? I think they were getting hard information from extraterrestrial beings that are probably a, a half a million years ahead of us in evolution and in technology. I mean, that's another whole show. As a child, I was on a ship in, at age 11 up in Canada. It's long and in, involved, and, and it was just meant to let you know that I know these things are real. That's what set me on my course to write this book in the first place. I was shown at age 11 in 1950 a complete display uh, when I was on the ship. They, they wanted me... I, okay, whew, I was part of a group of children that they were harvesting, meaning that... They were investing in having experiences with us mentally and spiritually. And I would go on OBEs. You know what an 
out-of-body experiences? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I used to go out at age 5, 6, 7, and 8 in OBEs that they would let me remember. And I was going to this big classroom setting where there were thousands of other children, just like myself, all happy and healthy. And we were like being scanned to find out if if we would like to participate in, in help, and to be helpmates for humanity. In other words, AIDS. The reason I wrote this book was not to scare anybody. It was to tell everybody we got to do this. Let's take you know put our gloves on. Let's get to work. We got a lot to do. There's going to be a lot happening to the planet. I believe there's going to be a huge exodus. I believe there's going to be a huge liftoff by the ETs of billions and billions of people who are mentally, spiritually, and physically tuned to the planet and understand the dynamics of metaphysics. Well, we're seeing more and more of that every day. In fact, there was something in, uh, that just happened the other day in uh, Devon, in the in, uh, U.K., uh, a number of people saw several UFOs flying around in a 45-degree angle. Yes. It, and said it was the, the, the most unusual thing they have ever seen in their entire lives. One of the things I'm going to predict, let's, let's go public on your show, okay? I, I'm predicting as of today that we are going to be seeing a gradual but surely increasing rate of UFO sightings, landings, contacts, and communications. And I think we're starting to just now begin to see it form. What, what is it that the what is it that the alien are the aliens trying to communicate with us to warn us of what's about to happen or what what is their specific purpose in in showing themselves? All, all of the above. You, you you hit right on it. The crop circle thing. If you really if people really understood what, the, what crop circles are all about. Now, let's throw away the fakers and let's throw away the little guys that run around with broomsticks. Those are not what I'm talking about. If you really understand the phenomena, and if you've really had a ch I've had a chance to look at the Russian evidence up close, and it is absolutely astounding. If you know anything about crop circle technology, which is another show. Here we go again. You know? Absolutely. All right. Everything's another show, correct? Absolutely. Well, <laughs> you know, do you realize the kind of ground you and I are covering in this time right now? I I feel like I'm I feel this by the way this is how I conduct a lot of my lectures it's it's kind of free for all with the audience and by the time we get rolling the information starts coming as it's coming now but let let let's go back to to answering your question specifically about the ETs okay yes of of course they're communicating with us they've never not been communicating with us if you understand anything about the field of ufology it's still considered to be very, very controversial. And you know what, Stephen? That's good because that brings attention to it. But it's, I think it's beginning, to, beginning now to become mainstream. Um, I think one of the latest polls conducted, possibly Gallup, I'm not sure, something like overwhelmingly 68 to 75 percent of the population no more has any doubts about UFOs and ETs and flying saucers and all the movies and everything we know. And yes, of course, there's space people out there, and if they're here, so what? People are almost blasé to the fact. How much Star Trek can you absorb? <laughs> or Star Wars? Or Indiana Jones? The, the point of the matter is, the public is not stupid. The public, is, the public has been seeing science fiction UFO movies since the early 1950s. Remember the day the Earth stood still? Correct. With in fact, and, we were playing the music there just at the beginning of the show. Yes, you were. I just wanted <laughs> to get just wanted to get that in. So let's let's give everybody a break and let's just open the door and open the files and say, you know what? The United, you know, did you know that the United States, Great Britain, New Zealand, Canada, and and Australia, and a few of these other sober Western countries, they're the only ones that have secret UFO information files that haven't been opened. So I the, find that very the, what's ironic. The and you know what? All of this? Whatever. What's the government's role in all of this? And 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 what's this? Uh, what's this? What's this going on over there at this uh, Area 51? In, well, in Area 50. Okay. Well, let's see. Okay. There's a couple of questions in one again. Okay. Let's go at both questions with this with this explanation. Okay. UFO 51. There there are a dozen TV specials you can rent, by the way, or you can cl click in for or buy on Area 51. But I'll give you a recap. Area 51 used to be a very, very top-secret um, air base deep in the heart of the Nevada desert, not not too far out of Las Vegas, 
uh, Nellis Air Force Base is associated with it, where they've built some very sophisticated um, labs, hangars, where they do top-notch and, and top-secret black ops uh, experimenting on airplanes and airfoils and things like that. It's also rumored to be where they have back-engineered several crashed what we call flying saucer disks. That's been the big UFO, you know, secret thing that people have been investigating. Well, they've uncovered more information than they ever thought they would, and after everybody poo-poos them, the government still denies it, but you still can't get access, and you're arrested if you try to take one step on the land. They got you. So I guess... Where there's smoke, once again, there must be some fire. So that's the story in Area 51. It's still top secret, supposedly. They, they are still doing their engineering. You can't get anywhere near it. Now, what is, what, is it, what is the government really doing? They're doing nothing. They're not doing anything to help or harm it because there's so much else going on to distract the public. They don't have to cover this thing up the way, you know, they, they should have to do it. Okay? Now, with the danger of this, these incoming objects, or this object, I believe all of these things are now going to come gushing, gushing out of the glove that they've had it contained in, you know. And I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a glut of information suddenly left open, not not by accident but by design. And I am going to talk to our senator about the fact that the government should now disclose this information. So I'm going to start to lobby him to find out if there's any interest uh, in Congress or in the Senate of opening up these gates, I think it would get, make the people feel a lot better going into the election if they knew what was going on. Would well, you how, are they going, how are they going to explain to the masses that for all these years they've been covering up the fact that something is going on in outer space <coughs> uh, that's affecting um, uh, the Earth changes, affecting our climate, and then using this excuse that it all has to do with global warming? Well, maybe it does have something to do with global warming, but obviously there's a celestial body up there that's creating quite a bit of what's going on. How are they going to explain themselves? Oh, well, it's quite simple. It's two words, national security. (laughs) It's a matter of national security. Look, it's totally, totally reasonable. I think they probably did. Looking back, you know, here I am, the first proponent to say, I know they're covering it up. Listen, you have to cover something like this up until you understand it. Do you follow me? You yep. can't go public on something you don't understand. You're not even sure it's going to happen, but you sure feel the heat coming under your heels, okay? They did the right thing. They kept it quiet. But now it's time. Uh, is, has the country been prepared for almost a full year? Every, do you realize that every week since, since the fall of 2007, from the fall of 2007, every single week, including all the winter months, there has been a tornado somewhere in the United States of America. Right. And they're still continuing even today. It's been an uninterrupted tornado season. But that's normal. No, it's not normal. What's not normal are the temperatures. I did an interview this morning with a DJ in Denver. It is the hottest cycle of weather they've had in 200 years. 200 years. That's significant. That tells you that there's something wrong. Okay? Now... We need to understand what's happening, not only climate-wise, but what's going to happen to the rest of the world if we should suddenly get some big natural disasters. Do you remember the 9.0 quake that struck Indonesia uh, in the winter of 2004 to 2005? Do you remember that? Yeah, correct. I think that was uh It, it created that huge 04. tsunami no. disaster. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, Stephen, consider this. 250 over over 250,000 people died instantly in 45 seconds. That's right. In 45 minutes. In 45 minutes. The day That's how long it took for the for the waves to arrive, correct? Right. Mm-hmm. To the various locations. It wasn't just one location. It hit it hit in numerous locations. Right. So, mostly the within point, the Indian Ocean, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. The the point of even bringing this up is the fact that we're not prepared. We're not even thinking about it. We're too concerned about the election, which we should be anyway. But the point is, this is all about to come down on our shoulders. Now, we've got to start thinking rationally about what we're doing, and that's another reason why I wrote the book, hyphenx.com. Interesting, can I tell you a really quick, funny something? I've got, I've got a section on, 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 on my website where I put on what was sent to me, a submission by, by a guy who insists that the Earth's 
inclination has is now beginning to to, to tilt and he's got all the dynamics so he sent me a beautiful uh graphic so I put it up <laughs> and suddenly it disappeared last week and there was a sign that came up it said deceased oh lord <laughs> i think the government had a little fun with me at my expense so uh huh I'm getting ready to reload, and I'm going to talk to the senator about this, too. <laughs> Isn't that cute? See, they don't want to talk about anything that might suggest that there's something wrong. Well, I do believe we are tilting. I believe the tilt has already started. Let, really let, me, tell, let me ask you something about this tilt. Do you think that maybe this has something to do with the uh, fluctuation in weather that's occurring, whereas in Canada right now it's it's as hot as hell? Or in some other part of the country, it's, it's as cold as can be right now? Oh, no, sure. Every, everything's everything's tipsy-topsy-turvy. Nothing's working right. The, the inner core of our planet is being heated up and excited by the core of the sun. The sun, the sun itself is doing it. And as so, I believe it's starting to spin faster. See, I, I think that the amount of radiation and energy that is exciting the core of our, our planet, this is what is causing it to speed up. And as it speeds up, it heats up, and therefore, I believe that it's starting now to send lava out to all the volcanic mounts. I think that we are are in the process of having the planet come alive like it was designed to do to rebuild itself. You see where I'm going with this? Right. Yep. I think we're going to a series of huge earthquakes and volcanic events, and I think it's what the planet would normally be doing anyway because of the return of this object. Now... It does so happen that it happens to coincide with a lot of religious thinking, especially the evangelicals. They believe that we are now at the end times. And I believe that we are at definitely at some kind of end time operation for this planet the way we, the way it's now functioning. What's I think the Vatican's we're, position? We're about to hit the wall. What's the Vatican's position on this? I understand they have a telescope mounted somewhere in Arizona? No, they've got three or four of them all around the world. Uh -huh. The Arizona one is probably probably your most expensive and, and the one one that's fitted with the infrared. But you see, that's off limits. That is top secret. No one gets in, and no one no no one has access. That's it. Period. And as are all their other observ observatories. What's their position? Well, let me jump back. I've had a chance to talk to somebody who spoke to the last remaining survivor of the three Portuguese children who witnessed the miracle at Fatima. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Jacinta, I, th I think it was Jacinta. The, the, one of the two girls recently died, but I have a dear friend who had a chance to sit and talk with her at the Vatican. By the way, they, they brought her into the... She's been virtually living at the Vatican now for dozens of years. She was immediately well, I wasn't taken, aware of that. She was immediately, yes, she was immediately taken out of, and probably for her own good. I'm not saying anything sinister like that. Right. It was probably for her own good so she could be tended to, her needs, her health, and things of that nature. Because, you know, she, she was an average peasant person. Okay? Now, her and my friend's understanding is that the third secret of Fatima had to do with the return of this planetary body called Wormwood. And that it would affect the Vatican and every structure in the Vatican, and it would it would it would definitely impact the church's survival itself, the very survival of the church itself, and that they were start that they should have been getting ready for this. Now maybe they have and maybe they haven't been getting ready, but the Vatican knows a heck of a lot more than they're telling us. So you see, it's one big kind of I don't want to use the word conspiracy, but nobody talks about it. Why? Because everybody knows that what's coming is inevitable. And I think that's what all the Mayan myths were all about. And I think that's what all this cosmology on the part of the ancients was all about. Because our research indicates, and that's what the book is all about. Wait till you read the prophecy section. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. By the way, do you know what remote viewing is? No. Remote viewing? Remote viewing is a science that was developed in the early 70s using people with with extreme mental skills to transgress time and space and mentally view things it's called remote viewing they, they is that sort they, of like mental telepathy or it's like, well it's it's a form of telepathy but in this case it's sending your thoughts out as as information vehicles or cameras 
it's 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 a real science. It was developed. I'm I'm good friends with one of the originators of it, uh, Dr. Hal Putoff. Uh, the cat uh, involved with the Academy for Advanced Science in uh, in um, Austin, Texas. Anyway, uh, I'm talking to him. I, I still haven't got the okay, but we're trying to put together a remote viewing opportunity, possibly working with the Russians, who are very much into remote viewing, by the way. They developed the same time we did, because they found out we were doing that to them, so they did it to us, and they beat us at it. We're talking about the much, Russians. They were that much better at it. Talking about the Russians now. Russians. Um, um, Tell us about this uh, Russian Space Center training complex outside Moscow. It's called Star City. Star City? Yeah. How, how did you gain permission to uh, visit this, uh, this, I guess it's a cosmos, cosmonaut it's the site, Cosmonaut right? Training Center. Yeah. Just, just like Houston there? and and Cape Canaveral. Okay. Um, because of my friendship with, with uh, now-retired uh, Colonel Morena Popovich, um, the famous lady test pilot, um, I visited. I, I revisited. Uh, I, I visited for the first time um, Moscow in in, uh, in 1992, and um, we we were invited by Morena. She okay. Her husband used to run Star City. Now for who years was her husband? Uh, General Paul Pavel Popovich. And he was a cosmonaut, right? Yes, he was the second man in space. Okay. For Russia. And he ran that training center for a number of years, so they they maintained a very nice apartment complex there. And she now she has it. That that's her home when she's away. And Pavel has his, but it's in a different part of Star City. See, Star City is a vast complex carved out of the middle of a forest. It's it's at least I think it's eighty to ninety miles away from uh, Moscow. And the only way to get in there's one highway in, one two lane highway in. And one railroad in, and there's an airstrip, and that's it. So it's, it's a carved out of the forest for for like 60 miles. All you see is is a cut through the forest. Okay. Okay. So she invited us there. We spent the entire day, and um, we had dinner, and, and we had a chance to visit some of the facilities. Uh, I must tell you, it is one of the most Fascinating places. Imagine being taken through Houston. They have the same kind of machines and same kind of equipment and the and the and the wet tanks and all all of that kind of thing. So that's how I got a chance to visit there, and uh, we were the guests of uh, Morena, and it's something I will never forget. I couldn't take any pictures though. I'm on a mission to educate the planet about what could be its greatest opportunity to get control of itself. Okay, the whole planet, not just the United States. Not just Mexico, not just Canada. The entire planet is going is in for a rude uh, shakening. I like that a rude wake, a, a shakening. And it's going are we to be going? Horrendous. I know, I know what I know what's happening now. We're seeing it every day. But are you going to say? Uh, is it like like the prophet, uh, the uh, passage in the Bible that says that everything will happen uh, in increments, like a woman having a child? Yes. Is that the type of thing we're going to see, or is it going to happen quickly? We've already cracked the fifth seal. If you know anything about the book of Revelation, by the way, have you ever read or tried to interpret or understand the book of Revelation? As much as I can, but of course right. that's controversial. We go into great detail. Off. We we go into great detail in the book about it. Okay, now here's what I think is happening. I'm going to jump right into the book of Revelation and talk about the fact that once you read up to the fifth seal, that's where we are at the present time. We're about ready to crack the sixth seal uh, within the book of Revelation. And I think that will be when Wormwood makes its first appearance. Then I think the sixth seal will have been opened. So I'm giving you what we think, based on biblical prophecy and research that we've done. Remember, we, we read 2,000 books. We have over 2,000 references in the text after each chapter. So that if someone wanted to go back and re and re research what we did, we give you, you know, the the publisher, the page number, the IBID, all all of the information for you to go back and check on our books. So Do you think do you think that could have been the uh you know, we mentioned at the beginning of the show the uh the vision of Nostradamus back in the fifteenth century. Oh yes. Oh yes. In which he uh referred to a great monster in the sky. Of course his his date was nineteen ninety nine in the seventh month. Which some people has, have interpreted as the ninth month, actually, which would have been September. Mm -hmm. 
So he may he may have been off, uh, uh, you know, a, a decade or so. But do you think that that was his vision? Well, I think what happened if you look if you look back to that, give me that date again. Uh, it, his date was 1999, the seventh month. Seventh. Well, that would have been July. Okay. Yeah. If it's the seventh month, it would have been July. Okay. Yeah, but in in the interpretation of his quadrant, many people have referred to in French uh, in the French language as the seventh month being actually the ninth month. The Which ninth month, September. okay. Well, I think what would be interesting, and, and if anyone out there would like to take up this task, I would like them to go back to, to, the, to, to that month in 1999 and run some stats on, on was there a sudden uptick. I think that that date represents the start, the start Correct. of the decline cycle. I think that's what he was referring to, and it was, it's being caused by what he said, the destroyer. Yes. Okay, I think he was right on. I don't think he was a decade off at all because our research indicates the same thing. Since 1972, things have been going slightly askew. Since 1972, very, very gradually, through, through the 70s, through the 80s, and the things started uptick on the 90s, and now here we are into the 2000s. I think there'll be a gradual escalation of extremes on the planet, in including weather and all these other things. And okay. don't forget, by then, our election will have been over. Correct. And and whatever the the subsequent fallout of that election will greatly impact what's about to to befall us. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Well, we see, I want to I want to put that in perspective so that our listeners today can really understand what's going on. Uh, you don't need to convince me because I already know what's happening. But there's so many people out there that don't, and I think they're a little bit confused. So I just wanted to put that in perspective. Oh, absolutely. And 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 here's here's the thing. Here's the thing. Anybody can go around afraid. Anybody can go around nervous and biting their nails. If you know the enemy that you're facing, or if you understand the threat that you're facing, any common, logic, human, intelligent person would say. Well, what can I do to prepare and safeguard me, myself, my family, my my city, my region, my country, my planet? But we're not there yet because right. that's what all the signs are pointing to. Right. I just you know I just heard them recapping again. Well, we're not sure, but sometime in the next thirty years. Oh sure, oh sure, oh sure. If we're right about about this so-called Planet X, this this extra solar body coming through. You ain't going to have to wait 30 years. Our solar system is sliding from one phase from, it's very technical. It's, it's, it's like going, we're in the positive phase right now. We believe that we're going to be sliding into what's known as the negative phase. We're going to slide into a different dimensional shift within the, 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 the plane of the ecliptic of the galaxy. It's real complicated, but it's more than just the Earth going through her personal changes. It's what the ancients call the end of time, what the Mayans described as the New Age. See, there's a lot of metaphysics here. See, fortunately, Stephen, you have a, you have a firm understanding of the nature of metaphysics, which means what? Beyond the physical, does it not? Metaphysical? Yes. yes. Okay. So where we're at is that a lot of these things that I'm talking about and that we were writing about, and by the way, mine's not the only book. There are dozens and dozens of good books out there. But we've all seemed to hit on the same theme in that something's really, really wrong, and if something's really, really wrong, what's causing it? Well, we already know what's causing it. NASA knew back in 1982 what was causing it. It's just that we now have to step out of from behind the well, we're not sure what we're going to tell you is going to happen, and I think that what we need to do is just let everybody know that we're in for some rough times. Okay. So we need to start getting prepared. And shows like yours give everyone the opportunity to either send questions. And to, Incidentally, if anyone would like to email you and you want to forward me the questions, I'd be very happy to address those and uh, try to get those emails out for people who have questions on what we're talking about. Okay, very good. I'll keep that in mind. And, uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm always getting emails on different topics. And uh, certainly if we get something along. Um, to those who may be tuning in late to our live broadcast today, our special guest is Dr. Jason Rand, 
a highly respected ufologist and researcher, and author of the book, The Return of Planet X, Wormwood, Mankind's Ongoing Legacy with a Brown Dwarf Star. Jason Q. Rand has authored three books, including The Extraterrestrial Hypothesis, The Cosmic Blueprint for After, and The Reality Engineer. Dr. Rand travels widely, establishing close ties with his fellow ufologists and paranormal researchers, especially in Russia, where Rand has close ties with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Marina Popovich and her former husband, Army General Pavel Popovich, who both live in Moscow. Marino and Pavel remain active in the UFL field representing Russia. Blob. Jason, on the front cover of your book, In the Word Wormwood, what is, what is Planet X's relationship to the biblical wormwood as uh, Revelation chapters 8 verses 11 describes? And why is it uh, that important for each of us to understand in the cosmic realm of ancient prophecy as described by the Mayan and the, and the Sumerian civilizations, and it, with respect to the characterization stated in your book. Now, that's a, that's a, that's a mouthful there. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's real easy to explain because the subject is all unified. It's, it's all about the same subject. Okay, okay, look. First of all, we believe that Wormwood, as attributed to in chapter 8, verse 11, where it says, and the name of the star was Wormwood, is because we believe that it is the same biblical entity. Wormwood is the brown dwarf star that's inbound. All of our research and all the religious prophecy, everything that we comb through, hours and hours of research and notes, all indicated that there was a complete connection between events in the Bible, things like when Moses left Egypt, and all of these things all attribute themselves to having a common denominator, and that is a some kind of a brown dwarf star. In this case, we think that it is Wormwood. And it was prophesied. If it's prophesied in the book of Revelation, and as most practicing Christians believe that the book of Revelation is unfolding, then it would stand to reason that, once again, where there's smoke, there's fire. In this case, we think it's a big fire, and it's a big problem. Okay, So... That answers what we think Wormwood is. Now, in going on further with your question, what we have to understand is that as a society, we have to accept responsibility for our choices. Okay? And so there's enough information out there. Are we all crazy? You know, are we all just not right in the head? Are we all imagining all these things happening? I think not, because the literature and the science and the history all points to reality. And I think it's an exciting time to be alive, Stephen. You're going to be on this planet as it goes through one of its greatest transitions in the history of mankind, in the history of the planet itself. You know, when all these former ages came and went, there were very few people on the planet. You realize that. It's only been about the last 15 to 25,000 years, or maybe a little bit further back, that we've really had the, the kind of thing that humanoids bring to the planet. Yeah, there was lots of animals, lots of ages, and lots of very strange animals, but we're talking about you know, the idea of, of, of Homo sapien at, at the end here. So we're about ready to see something transpire with almost 7 billion people now on the face of the planet, which we never had before. So we're about ready to see a great experiment. And the experiment simply pits man against nature. I know that sounds kind of rough, but, you know, it's always been that way, you know? That's correct. And, and throughout history, there have been whole civilizations wiped out by volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and the supposed demise of Atlantis and all of these things. The research that we did opened me up to understand that I really knew very little before I cracked into the subject. I mean, I had read lots of books on it, but you know, until I sat down and did the research myself, digging facts out, it was just absolutely frightening at how everything that was happening today points exactly to what happened before. 
with other civilizations and other time periods and other catastrophes. Except the, the situation was there were very few, very few humans around. Did I, did I hit those two points for you? Yeah, you did. I was going to ask you a question regarding, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, mankind's existence here on Earth in the last uh, 20,000 or so years. And you know, we're giving I, general terms and periods. I mean, rather yeah. than try to give specifics, it's but, 25, you know, 15, 20, 25,000 years ago. I think uh, the uh, question that a lot of people have uh, have asked uh, um, previously uh, regarding our existence is: uh, Are we a, a hybrid uh, civilization uh, that was created from a uh, alien uh, uh, entity, or or uh, did we come from another planet and, and accidentally end up here? Ooh, boy, that's a really loaded subject. I suppose there's several different ways. Almost any answer that I give other than a pure act of God, and, I, and I'm not saying it wasn't, the mere fact that we've come through various periods and seemingly have advanced in different stages. I mean, we, we, we can't look back into a subject like, like uh, anthropology and not understand exactly what, 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 what went on with the evolution of mankind. Now, Everybody argues, well, were we created or did we evolve? Well, anything that evolves has to be created, correct? That's correct. You, you can't, a life form can't evolve without somehow being created. So what a, what a silly, stupid argument, first of all. The two, the two arguments, to me, have never made sense. You cannot have evolution without creation. Now, what constitutes that creation? That's the subject. And that is the question. And when does creation begin? Well, these are questions that I think that are still beyond man's understanding, exactly what creation involves. Because we weren't there. We don't know. However, when it comes to mankind and humankind, I think it's safe to say that if we did evolve, we certainly had help along the way. Okay? My understanding from my UFO research indicates that there, there may be as many as 87 known identified extraterrestrial cultures and species out there, aside from what Star Trek showed us. Follow me? Okay. Now, if there are as many as 85 or 87 intelligent, functioning, super-advanced cultures, races, and technologies than ours, we ain't so high. So we have a lot to learn and we have a lot to think about, Okay. If they found a way to get here, which a lot of them seem, seems that they have found a way to come to and, to and fro, back and forth, we can't even get back to the moon comfortably at this point. You think we it's true that there's, there's probably some alien forms that are actually among the masses at this point? Oh, I, I believe that there are hybrids. I, bro, I, bro, I, bro, I believe that there are ET entities. That was the subject of the Cosmic Blueprint for After, by the way, which is the Treatise on Human Cosmic Reality post-2012. Um, I think that what, what we have is a, a variety, a myriad of extraterrestrial life forms that are capable of mingling with ours, just like your best science fiction movie. It's not that they take you over. They can assimilate almost any life form that they wish to reassimilate they're that far ahead of us so if they if you feel sometimes that you have someone thinking in your head you very well may have some form of an extraterrestrial presence doing a mind link or a telepathic communication with you by the way many 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 people communicate with ETs telepathically there are thousands of people out there who have this talent and this capacity and a lot of them are in Russia by the way so would they be blending in for sort of a... Uh, for the uh, mission. It's all part yeah, of the same goal. Right. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, there's going to be Earth disasters, but they're not going to destroy the planet. They're going to shake it up. They're going to change things around. You know, they're going to they're going to make everybody wake up and think. And yes, possibly a billion or more people may die. It's inevitable, especially those people along seacoasts. Look what happened in 2005 in, Dece in that December-January tidal wave. So... What we have to realize is that we have plenty of time to start thinking about it and reading and understanding, and let's get prepared. In the book, there's a whole chapter on self-preparedness. There's a whole sample, a dietary 
and food supplement uh, budgets and, and outlays and menus uh, that, that will take you through a three-month to four-month period. You know, everybody, every, FEMA says, well, I'll have three days of food and water and shelter. Listen, <laughs> I went through the Northridge quake. I didn't have a home for a week. I bounced around on people's couches, and they even slept in my car. My apartment building, Stephen, was in a wreck. It was in pieces. It was red-tagged. I had to get out because it could have come down at any time. So having two or three or four days is great, but you better have a preliminary place to park it in case your dwelling or your automobile is destroyed. Incidentally, the the pantry cabinets in the uh, out in the back where the cars are parked fell on the hood of my beautiful old Cadillac. And I, so I even had damage to my automobile to, t- to yeah. top all the damage in the apartment. I was, what, do you, what do you say to all these? Uh, what do you say to all the people who uh, are living for today? They're into their modern technology, and can, they're considering the fact that well, if this thing comes, or we're going to lose everything we have. How are we going to start over like they did back in the 16th or 17th century? Well, mankind has been picking himself up by the bootstraps since time began. Okay, look. Not everybody is unprepared. See, I, I don't want it to sound like I think nobody's prepared. I think there are millions of people in this country who understand what's at stake. Certainly, certainly, a lot of regi- religious groups do. Look at the Mormons. Do you realize the Mormons have supplies for up to five years? Oh yes, I, I'm aware, quite aware of that. <laughs> now, I don't fault that at all. No, absolutely Aside from not. all these Mormon controversies, I think it's a good idea. It's a good idea. They they do take care of their families. They look after their communities. I wish more people would act like Mormons act in ter- in terms of of physical spiritedness and and well being with people. Now, what we need to do is we need to each of us take individual stock. How much food do we have? How much water do we have stashed? Do we have reserves? Set aside some canned food. Set aside in a safe place that you could get to other than in your home. You see. You know, do we have a little camping trailer stash somewhere? You know, where would we go if we suddenly lost our houses? So we need to understand what's at stake here. If we live on the seacoasts, I strongly advise you having a safety plan. If sudden bad weather or if there was a, a, a tsunami alert, that you would be able to have a plan to get out of Dodge. Do you think the government would put us into a martial law state? Instantly. How do you get out when the, when they're blocking off all the major access out of the area? It's really damn tough. It's, I cover it all in the book. I take you all through the stages of of, of, of uh, martial law, where we're at, when it was erected, who did the signing. I give you a complete review of what the government knows and what they don't know, what they should be doing and what they're not doing. So it's an interesting read. I and think that's, that's chapter, chapter 10 seven. of your book, correct? Uh, chapter 7. Oh, chapter 7, Okay. Government prepar- I think government preparations. All right. All right. Now, I want everybody to understand that there is no such thing as total destruction. There's going to be rough. There's going to be storms. There's going to be fires. There's going to be tornadoes. There's going to be earthquakes. And probably some uh, volcanoes that go off. We have to figure out, be prepared. There are certain places that are safe. I cover this in the book. There are certain places that are kind of iffy. West Coast is kind of iffy. Portland, Northwest area, very iffy. Vancouver, very iffy. Why? It's part of the Ring of Fire. I I, I worry about Japan very much. I very much worry about Japan. I worry about the Hawaiian Islands. Now they what about may come India? Up. They may come up rather than down, yeah. but even coming up can be very traumatic. Go ahead. Uh, India? Yeah. Oh, boy. All the third world countries and, and, the, and the newer democratic countries like India, I think they're going to suffer huge losses. A lot of their country is, is, is at sea level. I think all of Indonesia, all the island, island nations are going to be at stake. I fear for Great Britain. I fear for the coast of, eastern coast of Europe. I, al- I also fear for South America. And quite a bit In of fact, that. All the, all the continents are going to be affected. Yep. If if there's a huge global ship, sh- slippage and the crust shift, shift, the continents will shift. There'll be huge, huge tidal waves, thousands of feet high, sweeping across the oceans in, in mere hours. Well, that was the next question I was going to ask you. Um, how close will Planet X travel towards the Earth as it crosses that solar ecliptic? 
And and then what kind of effect will it have on the poll? Well, there's been so much theory and so much conjecture. I honestly cannot tell you that I know where exactly it's going to come through and emerge. Blood. The worst could be that it could come in through the solar system in a clockwise motion against the flow of the planet, possibly coming through between the asteroid belt and Jupiter. Now, that's a far-fledged analogy, but that's where we think it could be coming through. And now, if it is does, that what some have referred to as a sort of a retrograde orbit across yes. uh, the solar system? Yes. Okay. Y yes, exactly, exactly. Now, what we could, what we might wind up with is, like I said, a glancing blow. Even it will be destructive. Even anything coming that close outside the solar system is going to affect everything in it. We're, I believe we're already seeing the signs of this, these Earth changes taking place all around us. The volcanoes, the fire. And, you know, I know it sounds like doom and gloom, and I know it sounds like, oh, my God, but it's happening. It's not that I'm forecasting it. It's happening to us. I'm not making it up. You know what I'm saying? I don't have to invent these things. It just so happens that the subject of the book was well-researched, and so therefore it's timely. I, I will say that, you know. Um, well, did I answer your qu last two questions? I want to keep answering your questions. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask you, though, how does this blend in with uh, what we're hearing today from, the, from uh, most of the scientists across the, across the planet? Uh, from Al Gore and others about, about uh, global, you know, warming. global warming is affecting everything Let, that's Let's happening. kick at that. Let's kick at that. Now, what we're going to be dealing with is the fact that we have a short, limited amount of time in order to get the mechanism rolling. So if listeners, if your listeners are interested in, in finding out more, let them know that there are a dozens and dozens and hundreds of websites, including Nancy's website, for instance, there are lots of people talking about this phenomenon, not just me. I'm just one of possibly 100,000 people on the planet involved in it. But it's going to take all of us to get the word out, and it will take uh, inspirational hosts like yourself who are willing to investigate the subject to figure out exactly what is going on. And it's real. It's all happening right before our eyes. Yes, Wormwood, I believe, is the same um, entity that's referred to in, in, in the book of Revelation, and it's, it's the same solar body that I'm talking about. I believe it's a small brown dwarf star. It used to be sister star to our sun, cast out on a huge 3,600 to 4,000 year elliptical orbit way beyond the reaches of our solar system, and I think it's about to come back. I believe another term that had been used uh, by religious figures was uh, the great red ball of redemption. Yes, yes. Uh, by the way, uh, that, that's in our book. I, I cover about a hundred different names through time that have been attributed to this particular solar body. The red dragon, the, the, the planet of death, the, 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 the killer star, the death star. I mean, it's, it's all over the literature of the, the history of the planet. All we have to do is read. Incidentally, I list all the books in the. Oh, I have a great bibliography, by the way. If, if those of you that uh, are interested, um, in the back of the book is a, is a bibliography that will bring you so much knowledge in so quick a time that you'll suddenly become experts yourselves. How's that? Sounds great. All right. Any more questions I can uh, fulfill, or sh or do you want me to? Yeah, go let's go into. Uh, I want to talk warning. a little bit about chapter ten of your book, where you offer okay. the survivor's manual for those hoping to uh, minimize the devastation to themselves and their yes. families. Uh, what are some of your key suggestions, and when and when should the general public actually start to take heed, if not if they haven't already? Instantly. How's that? Right. Instantly upon hearing. Instantly upon hearing the words that you've offered in your program. If you start to turn on your thinking cap right then and there, you will just barely be in time. How is that? Do you know how short two and a half years is? We oh, need to be goes by fast. Things. And the older you get, the quicker yeah. it goes by. It, oh, my, my, by the way, I can I can tell you that my time frame in terms of of uh, reality construct seems to be speeding up. Just unbelievable. Oh, Twenty four yeah. hour day seems to come and go before I can even. Oh, figure out it's what unbelievable! I'm doing. It really is. So here's what we need to do. We need to take stock of our individual preparedness. We start with the individual. 
you, me, Mary, Richard, uh, uh, James, and, and Sally. All of us need to sit down, clear our minds, and figure out what would I do if suddenly I was confronted with horrendous news or a real disaster coming at me or I found that, that I was in the path of a tornado. What would I do? We have to figure out, first of all, where we live, very methodically. Where do I live? Where, where are the danger zones in, in, in each of the states that I live in? Do I live in a seacoast? Do I live near a large body of water like a lake, like Lake Michigan? Incidentally, Chicago, I greatly, I was born and raised in Chicago, by the way. Okay. I know the power of Lake Michigan. Can you imagine that sloshing out of its basin, three, four, five hundred feet high and rushing into downtown Chicago? Well, I don't think there'd be anything left of downtown. There wouldn't be much even to talk about. So, you remember Deep Impact, the movie? Yes. And remember the day after tomorrow, the big tidal wave that came crashing into Manhattan? Oh, yes. Okay, well, that's a possibility. I'm not saying it's going to be probable, but anything's possible. That's why these movies were made. By the way, these movies do more to hip the public and to get everyone's thinking cap on than you would ever, ever imagine. Okay, now, we need to individually take stock. Where do I live? Where are my safety zones? Do I live in a secure structure? Do I have emergency supplies? Do I have bandages? Do I have food? Do I have uh, emergency water, uh, medicine? Do I have pet food? Do I have diapers for the baby? Uh, do I have enough medicines for myself? And by the way, you should always keep a stash of coins, nickels, dimes, quarters, pennies, half dollars. These will become very valuable should the normal currency flow of the country be shut down. You'd have some. You follow me? Yes. Also, small bills. Dollar bills and fives. Anything larger, you're a big target. You should have you should have at least four, five, six, seven hundred dollars. I know. Where do I get the extra money? Well, you pinch it. You know, you pinch five bucks here and six bucks there, and you have change. And then you start to put some bills together, and they should be in a safe, secure, dry uh, environment, possibly inside of one or two plastic bags. Why? You want to keep the elements away from the money and the coins. Okay, medicine. Enough for at least a month. Enough aspirin, bandages, antiseptic, some alcohol, uh, iodine, things like that. First aid, uh, first aid kit. First, first aid, general first aid kit. Yeah. And okay. also get water purification tablets. Now, in the book, I tell you where to find all this stuff. There's a whole chapter devoted to a typical three-month to six-month hibernation period of what what you would do if you were stuck in your house for six months. Now, I know it's not fun to talk about, Steve, but look what's happened to the midsection of this country over the last 12 months with just tornadoes alone. Correct. Even if, even if those people were prepared, the tornadoes still took out their home. So we have to be prepared for whatever emergencies are coming. Now we're in the middle of a fierce firestorm season in California. Look what's happening to Yellowstone. Uh, not Yellowstone. Um, Yosemite? Yosemite. I'm yeah. sorry. I meant to say okay. Yosemite. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, if, if you've ever been there, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. It's just, it's awe inspiring. It's jaw dropping. I'd hate to lose it. But we have to be understanding that our planet is going through severe changes. Its weather patterns are all screwed up, the seasons are topsy turvy. The, the currents in the oceans are being disturbed and changed, the water temperatures. Let's talk about global warming real quick. And we, we got two more minutes? Yeah, we got, uh, about, we got about 21 minutes left. All right, let's talk about global warming real quick, okay? Now, I'm not a global warming expert. I'm not Al Gore. I don't claim to be. But I have done a little bit of research on it. We have a, we have a four-page spread in our book toward the back where we discuss global warming in earnest. We believe that there is such a thing called global warming. We don't disagree with the theory that there is this phenomenon going on. But what we disagree and what we beg to differ on are the causes of this phenomenon called global warming. Here's what we believe. We believe that the planet is heating up, partially because the core of the planet is heating up. And if you heat the core of the planet, don't you also heat the shell of the planet? Yes, yes. have to. And that shell connects to the surface, sometimes under the sea, 
where the, 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 the crust of the earth is met by the floor of the sea. Well, that radiates heat up through the water, doesn't it? Of course it does. You ever boiled an egg? You put the gas on or the electricity and it heats the pan, the pan heats the water and it cooks the egg. Okay. We believe that global warming is being caused probably at least 40 to 50 percent, which means a 50 percent increase in the global warming capacity because of the earth itself. Nothing to do with CO2, nothing to do with mankind. Although we're contributing greatly to the problem, don't get me wrong, mankind is not the sole cause. We also believe that the ring of fire is about ready to explode. You know what the ring of fire is? Yes. Okay. Now, it's transglobal. It cuts across almost three separate oceans. If the ring of fire goes, the game is up. It's over. If the ring of fire volcanoes explode, even if only three or four explode, it could cause us a terrible... Well, we're well, already seeing period. a lot of activity uh, in the Ring of Fire, you know, especially in Indonesia and yes. some of those islands in the in the South Pacific. All the Ring of Fire volcanoes are starting to pop. They're starting to they're starting to shake. They're starting to shimmer. They're starting to power up because I believe that the core of the planet is injecting because it's heating up. It's causing more magma flow. Now, there are thousands and thousands of small little baby undersea volcanoes at the base of these big volcanoes that are undersea. Like Kilauea, do you realize how massive the base of Kilauea is? Oh, it's tremendous. Mm -hmm. Several hundred miles in circumference. Yep. Several hundred miles in circumference. And we're seeing more increased lava flow there. Yes. Mauna Loa has been one of the most active volcanoes in modern times. In fact, it's never stopped, really never stopped flowing in, in recent times. Now, if this is any precursor to what we're to expect, Steve, we're about ready to experience another level of volcanic activity on the planet. Now, if all these little baby volcanoes are, in fact, venting under the sea, we must know about them. Come on, we've got sensors all over the planet for volcanic eruptions under sea. Why aren't we talking about it? Why aren't we really talking about the causes that may be causing global warming? Okay. I think that the oceans are warming because of the heating up of the oceans from volcanoes and the crust uh, underneath the, the lava pots. And this would be letting off a lot of methane gas, is that correct? Absolutely, which then contributes yep. to another problem in the atmosphere. You see, yep. it's, it's, it's multi-lethal no matter how we look at it. And so I what, think do you say, what do you say to the, the United reason. Nations, then, who keeps insisting that it's mankind who's to blame for what's happening here on Earth now? Because, because it's been misunderstood and overlooked and mishandled for so long that there is no escape now. So what are they going to do? Does the United Nations ever take responsibility for anything that goes wrong? Not really. It's always somebody else's fault. Haven't you noticed that? Yes. The very officials that run the United Nations are questionable. We don't want to go there, though, right now, do we? That, that's <laughs> not the focus of our, of our thing. Uh, suffice to say, the United Nations has got to get its head screwed on right. It's got to come clean with the public as well. It has to act as a united body for the protection of the planet. If not, then disband it and get rid of it. It's of no value. What they need to do is understand but the whole world right now is threatened. This goes way beyond national borders. Okay? And if you're right about your, your thoughts and your ideas and helping to get the information out, you are, in fact, involved in this mission in your own way and in your own mode of operation. And for that, I'm very grateful to you. We're reaching well, lots and lots of people today. What would be your, your future message to um, our listeners today uh, who may be taking your research and writing seriously? Well, I, I, first of all, I thank them for their interest. It, it's important in my position that I, I try to remain calm and collected and be, be hopefully the educator and the author and the, and the person who gets the information out. You know, I'm not a seer. I'm not a prophet. I don't claim anything like this. All I know is that my research has led me to believe that this planet and, the, and times that we are in right now are very significant. It ties in with all of the things we've discussed on your program today. And so what I would say is this, 
All you have to do is watch and listen for the signs. If I'm right about what I'm talking about, things are going to get increasingly worse. If they don't get increasingly worse, then the best that could happen from my discussions with you and the, and the effect of my book on the public is that we get better prepared for whatever is coming at our way and whatever is causing this global warming, the predictions are it's not going to go away. So I'm not out there all by myself making a projection that could go either way. I'm sure it's going to go some way. I predict and I worry that it's going to become more difficult than it's going to become more easy. I think we're in for huge planetary changes. I think we're in for a reality change. I think we're in for huge political upheaval in the world. I think that the planet itself is coming alive to do what it has to do to survive itself. Now, that may be an overly cosmic view, and it may be way too metaphysical for some people, but I honestly believe, Stephen, that we're involved in a very exciting time to be alive right now. We're going to see, witness, hear, and experience things that no other people at any other time in the history of this planet will be able to experience. So, frankly... I'm looking forward to the future. You know that that's where we're going to live the rest of our lives, don't you? Uh-huh. It's where? It's in the future. So we should prepare for that future. We should of course, be somebody aware. may be looking at that future as being one of, of, uh, of uh, um, inconsistency, a very bleak uh, outlook on, 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 on life's prospects. Uh, but it, you know, it's, living, it's without you the, the living without the computer and the TV, you know. Uh, yeah. How can no. people do this? Well, First of all, it's it's like it's like looking at the half empty glass. Are you looking at it as half full? Oh my God, I'm 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 almost out of water. Or are you looking at it half full and saying, Thank God, I got a half a glass of water here? It's how we perceive the future. It's how we perceive these forthcoming earth changes. Look, we know something's wrong. We know something is definitely wrong with not only the psychology of the human psychology of the planet, its survival techniques techniques, its preparedness, its its weather. Look, we're governed by the weather. Whether we like it or not, we are prisoners of our environment. We can try to shape the weather, but we can't control it. But the so skeptics, if we understand that that's there's something wrong... are out there telling us, oh no, it's all just a natural cycle. Something it is that a natural cycle. Every thousand no, it, years. <laughs> it, it, it is yes, it is a natural cycle, and 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 you've you've hit it. Yes, it's about every thirty six to, to four thousand years. We believe that this particular cycle comes back with vengeance. That's why in the book we talk about the fact that there are whole periods that mankind seems to drop out of itself. That it has to kind of get back up and shake itself back together again. We've seen this time and time and time again throughout history. And that goes back to this whole business of whether ETs are involved or not. I believe that as each one of these terrible time periods have come and gone, that we have had extraterrestrial help. The, the quote, the Noah's Ark of the heavens, okay, coming down. I do believe that they're collecting animal life right now. I strongly believe that they are that that, that, that there is a whole system of ET involvement where great great huge things called motherships are beginning to collect animal species. To, to protect them and bring them back when, when the planet settles down. I think that all these things are real. Now, a lot, of, a lot of your listeners may say, wow, this guy's really, really out there. Well, it comes from reading books. It comes from giving lectures. It it's come, comes from visiting Russia and talking with former cosmonauts and, and having a chance to write and research. My own personal library, I've got all, over 3,000 books. I love my books. If people like to read, they're going to love reading The Return of Planet X. And incidentally, books like mine will continue to sell for a long time because the subject in my book is racing headlong to meet the future. And I mentioned earlier that we are, we are, we are going to be products of the future, by the way. What our understanding is of who we are and, and our ability to survive in a, in a rapidly plummeting world will tell us who we are experientially and metaphysically we will be able to sustain ourselves. I want to ask you really quick, if we can, we've got like six minutes left, but I wanted to uh, what, ask you this question. What is your advice for those in the listening audience who believe that they themselves may have experienced a UFO sighting or a close encounter with an alien being or both? Well, I'm, uh, that's, 
that I'm so great grateful that you brought that subject up because it can be a touchy subject for some people, you know. Look, if you had an experience that you honestly believe in your heart that, that you did experience that you can either remember or you can write details down, if you yourself are individually convinced that you saw a valid sighting of an object in the sky, you know, flying saucers are all different shapes and sizes. There's wedge shapes, there's there's boomerangs, there's all, there's the round ones, there's the oblong ones. If you think you've had a sighting and you firmly, honestly believe it at your core, then you probably have had a sighting. You probably, honestly, have had a real-life sighting. If you think you've had visual contact with an ET or been in, near it or, or saw fleeting glimpses of it or actually communicated with one, well, then I don't have to convince you that your experience was real. You should know. Now, if you think you've had one of these, what you can do is, before you go to sleep at night, it's a good exercise. You know, say your prayers, you know, you know, bless me, dear Lord, and all the good stuff. And then lay back and clear your mind. And in your mind, you ask to remember your dreams and your experiences that you will be having now. That you consciously program your mind, metaphysically, to program and save these memories so that you can replay them in the morning you will be surprised at the wealth of information that you will start to either remember or become for the first time consciously aware of when you come out of the sleep state. We call it the dream state, by the way. So you have to rely on yourself and you have to trust yourself. And if you're not sure of something and you need to seek information, go to the Internet, go to the library, research the information. It, there's so much information, Stephen, out there right now that there's no reason why anyone should be afraid of these subjects or not understand them or feel that they can't interact with them. That's what these that's what these spiritual presences are, and that's what the ET culture is all about. They are beyond us physically. They are in other dimensions. And what we have to do is learn how to communicate with them. Now, they can take physical form, and they do have physical form, and they can be here, and they probably are here. And like we said earlier, yes, I do believe that our that our human species has been cultivated, and I believe that it has been altered and changed and enhanced. I believe that there are half reds walking around. I don't want to get into that. That's that's very controversial. I do know of some research in Russia that's going on about this. So for each individual the experience is different. For each individual, they have to understand who they are and why they are. And if they can figure out their mission in life, if they can understand if they've had an experience like this, then there has to be a reason why they've had an experience. Maybe somehow they're connected to it. Maybe they're somehow involved in, in an ET movement or some of some kind. Usually people that I encounter on the road in my ver you know, my talks and my visits and things like that, they'll come up to me and they'll tell me some very personal things and I'll say to them, Do you have a diary? Did you make notes on it? Well yes I did. Then go back to those notes. Look them over. Study them. And in meditative states, go back and try to relive the experience. You'd be surprised how much information will come back to you because basically your mind is already stored it. You know, it is a computer, and computers are designed to store information. You have to be able to unlock it, and there could be emotional reasons why you can't unlock lock these experiences. Don't forget, some people are very afraid of them, Steve, and I can understand that, especially small children. In my case, I wasn't afraid at all because I was led into it through a very uh, interesting system of, of, of advanced knowledge. Well, Dr. Did, I, Rand, did was, I cover that for you? Oh, you, cer you certainly did. You did an excellent job of it. Okay, buddy. Um, it was really great having you as a guest on our show today. Uh, my pleasure. I know and you thank spent, you, too. Uh, you spent considerable um, time and effort on your research into both the study of Planet X and... Uh, UFO intelligence. Um, your book is well documented, by the way. I think I've gotten through the first 30 pages of it, and I certainly would recommend it to anyone listening that has an interest in learning more about uh, this crossing of the planet, uh, which we also call Wormwood or, or Nibiru. So I want to thank you for your time, and, and, and Godspeed to you also, sir. Well, thank you, sir, and, and God bless our listeners. And remember, there's nothing to fear about the future. What we need to do is understand the future because that is where we will spend the rest of our lives here on planet Earth.